Hello and welcome to this evening's event, Immateriality in the Garden of Privatised Delights, which we're proud to present in collaboration with the British Council. My name's Amy Croft and I'm the Curator of Exhibitions and Events for Stowe. Stowe are proud sponsors of the British Pavilion and this evening, like many of you, we were planning to be in Venice to celebrate the inauguration with Manage and Madeleine. Now, we can't, now that moment has been postponed to next year, but it's a real honour to be together tonight virtually and to enjoy what I'm sure is going to be a rich discussion. Just a few notes about the Zoom webinar. Please ask your questions in the chat. These will come to me privately and I will contact you separately um, to request that you ask it in person during the Q&A session. When you are asking the question, you will be logged off and logged back into Zoom, um, so don't be alarmed by that. One of our speakers, Sita Solanki, remarked in the intro of her recent book that everything is made of something. Yet what we enjoy about Sita's book, Manage and Maddie's proposals for the British Pavilion and Anna Mansfield's research at Publica, is that each also grapple with the more slippery, unseen or undefinable everythings and somethings of our built environment, which can often be overlooked as nothing. This explains a little why, as a material manufacturer, we were keen this evening to talk about both materialities and immaterialities of our shared spaces. But before I hand over to Severa Davis of the British Council, who will chair this evening's discussion, there's another much more direct example I'd like to give of the invisible powers of materials at work. Whether flanked by privately owned homes or public buildings, the air whipping through our cities is a space that we share and that carries both beneficial and harmful content for each of us. Yet similar to its location, sort of floating in between more solid and identifiable objects, the ownership and responsibility for the air wafts in between no one and someone, public or private, making the prospect of cleaning it up a very complex one. With this predicament in mind, I found it incredibly exciting to learn about Stowe's photocatalytic paint. Uh, it's called Photos and Nox. And what I can't believe about it is that by painting the outside of our homes, motorway tunnels, schools, factories and public buildings in any colour you desire, we could also be invisibly breaking down the harmful nitrogen oxides in the air, enabling individuals and groups to reclaim and clean our common air. So to return to Seattle's statement, everything is made of something. It is the process of considering what that something is and how it interacts with the environment it is placed in that goes to the core of Stowe's ethos of building with conscience and is what we are looking forward to unpicking with the help of our wonderful speakers and chair this evening. So without further ado, I hand over to Severa, Severa Davis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us online for this exciting event with Stowe Werkstatt exploring immateriality in the Garden of Privatized Delights. I'm Severa Davis, Director of Architecture, Design and Fashion at the British Council, which also bestows upon me the role of Commissioner of the British Pavilion at the International Architecture Biennale in Venice. As Amy just said, we are gathered here today on what would have been the opening of the British Pavilion in Venice as part of the 2020 Architecture Biennale. But instead, we will gather in Venice next year in May 2021, but we're very happy to be here tonight exploring the themes of the British Pavilion, the Garden of Privatized Delights. I'm shortly going to introduce our very distinguished panel and we'll get straight into our discussion and your questions. But before I do, I want to take this opportunity to thank Stowe for their support, not only of this event, but of our larger Venice program. Stowe is one of the British Council's most collaborative and forward thinking partners. We're grateful to them for their generosity in helping to make our work and our vision possible. And while I have this stage or screen. I just want to use this opportunity to also thank the other supporters of our Venice program. Bear with me for a moment. Um, there's quite a few of them, but they all deserve a mention. Foster and Partners, Arup, KRA, Zoom to Bell Group, FINSA, Borough Happold Engineering, Forbo, We Supply Wood, Clayworks, LED Linear, Neri, 
Precision Lighting, Richter Lighting, Light Forms, and the White Wall Company. Our thanks go to all of them. The British Council is a registered charity and its work in the arts is a cornerstone of our mission to create friendly knowledge and exchange between the people of the UK and the wider world. We rely on the generosity of supporters like Stowe and those I just mentioned to realize our arts program fully across 110 countries and a range of disciplines around the world. The British Pavilion in Venice is the flagship program in our global arts portfolio. It's hard to underestimate just how important the Venice Biennale is to the world stage of architecture. It demonstrates the breadth and depth of architectural imagination from around the world. In an increasingly complex and uncertain world, the theme of the 17th International Architecture Biennale is the question, how will we live together? At this moment, I think we can all agree there is no more urgent or relevant question than this. The British Pavilion exhibition, The Garden of Privatized Delights, directly addresses this question and that of privatized public space. What is it? How is it used? Who gets to use it? And finally, what's the role of materiality and immateriality in these spaces? On that note, I'm delighted to introduce our panel for this evening. Firstly, we have Madeleine Kessler and Manage Verghese of Unseen Architecture. Madeline and Manage are the curators of the British Pavilion at the 17th International Architecture Biennale to be held in 2021. Madeline Kessler is an associate architect at Haptic Architects. She trained in architecture and engineering and has worked internationally on a range of projects, including infrastructure, theaters, and urban design. She's also on the National Infrastructure Commission's design group. Manage Verghese is head of public programs at the Architectural Association, where she organizes lectures, open seminars, and other special projects for a range of audiences. She's worked for architecture practices, including John Pawson and Foster and & Partners, and has contributed to a number of design publications, as well as think tanks, books, and peer-reviewed journals. Next, I'm delighted to introduce Anna Mansfield. Anna is the Director of Strategy and Research at Publica, a London-based practice that specializes in strategies and design for public space, urban design, and master planning. Anna has over 15 years experience in urban design and architectural practice in the UK and internationally. She advises organizations from across the spectrums of development and planning, including the City of London, City of Westminster, Transport for London, and many others. She's also a member of the Mayor's New Infrastructure Advisory Panel. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sital Solanki. Sital is a translator of materials. She's the founder and director of Matter, a relational practice focused on building and bridging kinships between ourselves, materials, the immaterial, and the virtual. She's the author of Why Materials Matter and also a textiles tutor at the Royal College of Art. Please join me in welcoming our amazing panel for this evening. So to kick things off, um, I'd like to actually ask our, our panelists a very direct question about materiality in public space. Specifically, what role do materials play in opening up privatized public space for new users or activities to take place? Sital, could I ask you to answer this question in the first instance and then ask our other panelists to come in? Yeah, of course. Um, would you mind putting up my first slide, please? Okay, so it's a real honor to be here tonight and um, speaking at this very sort of prolific panel. Um, so here we have two very sort of polar opposite images or spaces. So one very traditional London pub, and then the other we have um, a, a, play, a sacred space. So between them both, they're, they're both public spaces, but they have very different codes of conduct. One might say rituals even. The materials being placed within these environments provide the guests uh, who are entering these spaces a set of rules of how you should behave in these spaces. 
materials become signals and perhaps even signifiers. And that's due to the very nature of their identity. So for example, in the sacred space of the uh, marble temple, there, um, there's almost like um, a sacredness or a cleanliness, even a calmness, I would say. There's somehow a spiritual sort of reflection in the space or a place for contemplation. And I think that's down to the fact that this is a very precious material and it offers some sort of contemplation. I think there's both material and immaterial sort of qualities that represent this space. And then there's the pub, obviously, which has a very different way of engaging with materiality. One might say very ordinary materials, uh, very everyday even. So these materials need to be replaced more often, for example. So the, material, the materials need to be more available or abundantly available. Whereas the temple is such a precious material that excavating or extracting this material from the earth requires a lot of energy, even destroys the earth. So there's a lot of care and attention that needs to be paid with those materials. Whereas the pub, the pub takes a lot of abuse, as we all know. And so the materials also need to take that kind of abuse. And so it needs to be replaced more often, perhaps. And then if you can turn to the next slide, which is the one with the forest. So this is also another public space. And the materiality within this space is very different. It's, it's in a rural environment, whereas the others were in urban environments. This perhaps offers a bit more contemplation and these are living and breathing materials. One could say more abstract, such as air and water and land, even the ether. Or might, some might say like there's a consciousness to materials as well. So there's an abstract nature to it as well as a physical nature to it. And these, this environment in particular has very different rhythms and cycles uh, that vary a lot in, in comparison to say a urban environment. There's more breathability, for example, whereas an urban environment is more dense. Um, actually, I live in the suburbs. So um, in this particular situation of the crisis, I feel quite grateful to have a bit more space Whereas I'm actually more of an urbanite, so it's quite a, a strange place to be a lot of the time. But in this particular situation, I'm quite grateful. But I would say a lot of this sort of goes back to the idea of material intelligence as well. So materials are quite intelligent in comparison to humans. They actually need to tell us what we should do with them. So for example, a tree, is inherently intelligent because it actually communicates with other species. And even the mycelium network that's underneath it, that communicates to other species as well. So there's like a communication network as well as um, it providing us oxygen or shade um, when it's required. So I think the plant consciousness is also very um, prevalent in terms of like its immateriality as well as its physical nature. So yeah, that's me done on that. I think um, the, the, the examples that you've given are, are really, um, uh, they, they demonstrate the kind of different types of um, privatized public space that I guess we're trying to engage with in the pavilion. Um, Maddie and I have found that often when you say the word privatized public space, um, people think that it refers to just these paved developments, um, paved squares and new developments. And actually, we found it's something that's really been embedded in British culture historically through interior spaces like the pub or along the high street, as well as kind of parks and squares, um, playgrounds, um, and others, other kinds of spaces. And so there's a huge variety to what can fall within the category of privatized public space. And that's really been something we've been trying to learn from in terms of the materials that are used in those spaces, but also what can be done to um, move away from only using this kind of hard landscaping outside and what can we learn from interior spaces as well as vice versa. So as you were talking about the abuse within the, that the pub 
sometimes has to undergo. Like how can we change the materials there to suggest um, a variety of uses that could make the pub maybe more resistant to the changes it's undergoing currently um, and allow for different users to feel like they can access and, um, and take some sort of ownership over those spaces. Yeah, I think it also highlights really well, um, <clears throat> like the need to move away from sort of generic privatized public spaces and thinking that there might be one solution that fits all. Um, when in fact, it's really important to sort of take into account local context and um, from, from both like a physical and societal point of view. Um, and I, I think those examples um, just sort of demonstrate that really well. Here I wanted to talk about how we really read materials in the city and in public realm. So actually, can I have the, the first image, which is just Soho, which is a map, please. So we did a project in 2015, actually now, a Soho Area Survey and Strategy for Westminster City Council. And we were looking very closely at the condition of the streets. And Soho is a really beloved area, obviously, in a uh, beloved part of London. Hopefully the map will be arriving soon. But we can see where there has been a lot of development, which is traditionally on the edge. It's kind of not eroded, but it's changed the feeling. So it's made almost a shrinking Soho kind of feeling. And it's something that we wanted to document because that change will happen over. So in the map, you can see uh, what was the core of Soho. So what's commonly understood is the outside uh, red line boundary. And over time, as it develops and, and it's improved and upgraded, it changes its feeling. And so the next slide I want to is, is actually called Soho Streets, which is an example of two, which is what it feels like actually. And what it, you know, we're arguing a lot for keeping it to be feeling like this. So not massive improvement. Incidentally, the, the slide on the left is Broadwick Street, which um, really pertinently now, this is one of London's most important spaces of epidemiology. So this is where uh, in 1854, John Snow discovered cholera wasn't from miasma, it was from the water and it's marked in this space. It's really pertinent now to how we use it. But the main thing is that we read it, we understand it, we know how Soho should feel. And um, everyone we spoke to felt strongly about that and they really understand it. So that continuous ground plane that feeling of how the city flows into spaces, both public and private, is really critical. Thank you so much, Anna, and, I, and, and all of you on that. I think that goes very well to um, the next question, which is sort of, it's not quite the opposite to my first question, but it's about this question of immateriality and um, a sense of belonging, you might say, in our, the spaces that we inhabit. inhabit. And so specifically, I'm thinking about um, privatized public spaces and, and the rest of our built environment. And I wonder, um, Madeline and Manage, if I could come to you first on that to comment around kind of what you see as um, the immaterial qualities in privatized public space. Sure. So um, there's a whole range of things that can fall under the category of immateriality in privatized public space. And it's often um, maybe those things that are somewhat problematic in allowing people to feel a sense of access and ownership or maybe knowing how to use these spaces. So it's often not clear um, the immateriality um, of like, I guess, ownership is something that we've been exploring. Um, like how to make um, the fact that what looks like a public space is actually privately owned um, more, I guess, transparent to people around it. So it's often through an act like a protest, um, for example, the Occupy um, movement. In, and then when it came to London and Paternoster Square, it was only when people tried to protest there that they realized that that was privately owned by the Mitsubishi Corporation. And um, I think how we can actually use signage and language and privatized public space to make ownership more, um, I guess, uh, more accessible and more transparent, but also to make it more aware of what people, make people more aware of what they can do in privatized public space, rather than, I think, not just in privatized spaces, but in all public spaces, there tends to be a lot of signage about what people can't do. And that's something that's a quite an easy fix that, you know, there's not a lot of signage that actually tells you what you can do or who you can contact to arrange events or activities in these spaces. And that's something that remains immaterial, but could be materialized in a very straightforward way. Yeah, you often um, don't know the rules until you break them, um, which can be really problematic because also it means there isn't really a lot of regulation around the rules of privatized public space. Um, and we think that right now this is even more important as ever is 
um, everyone's sort of into just their private homes and then outdoor space. Um, and there's some quite, quite exciting sort of legislation being drawn up by um, the GLA looking at a public space charter. So they launched a draft of that earlier this year um, and it's going out for consultation later this year. Um, and one of the points they, um, they sort of have eight points that privatised public spaces should all be addressing. Um, and one of them is about transparency and making sure that any regulations are developed through public consultation and with people who, and, uh, who have access to that space. And another point is sort of looking at um, public, like welcoming the public so um, that everyone should be able to have access to privatised public space. Um, so hopefully things like this will help to open up privatised public spaces. Um, but obviously like these kind of invisible regulations um, and laws around them um, make it really difficult to know what you can and can't do and what you can access and, and what you can't. Um, there's a, I think maybe if you go to our um, first slide by Adriana, uh, The Disappearing Garden. Uh, well, uh, I guess um, it's a project by Adriana Cobo, who is doing her PhD at Central St. Martins, but is an architect and activist and is contributing to our um, catalogue for the exhibition. Um, but she, um, she's been doing a lot of work on how we can show some of the more immaterial but very necessary aspects in terms of how privatized public space is, is governed but also maintained. And so in this project she um, choreographed the group of cleaners that maintain Granary Square to create a kind of um, ephemeral painting. So they, they use their cleaning devices to, to, con to construct these paintings with water and they, over the course of the few hours they evaporated. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because she starts to take cleaning as this sort of form of drawing um, and then looking at maintenance as this form of art and her engagement with the street cleaners um, is very interesting as well because um, originally, initially when she proposes the idea to them, they're just like, you know, what, what we do is really boring and we're really bored of our job. And then um, through the engagement process um, of like, they, they decided what to draw and came to her with proposals and sort of this uh, pride in what they could produce um, came about. Um, and I think it's making people see all the different uh, people who, who contribute to these kind of spaces. And it's a nice example of how you can materialize the, these immaterial aspects, um, even if it's in a kind of temporal way. Thank you uh, both so much uh, for that. I think actually that you touched on it just then, and I think it's worth exploring because of where we find ourselves at the moment in the in the global situation. I think this all thinking about public space in new ways. Um, and I'd like, um, I guess, Anna to comment in the first instance just what you're thinking about how we might um, view public space, privatized public space differently in light of the current situation we find ourselves in and then our other panelists can come in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, what the last of 10 weeks has shown us is that we have a newfound appreciation for all kinds of public space, but also a massive awareness of its limitations. So in a number of factors, so uh, the, the it's, it's pretty clear um, that there's massive inequality in the distribution and access to public space. And also one of the things that also becomes quite clear is if the, quite a lot of your public space is private, it can be switched off in the way that other things can. So for example, part of the high walk in the city of London is closed because no one's there to open it. That means you can't literally access that anymore. And if we think about say drinking water and it's um, held within cafes and refill schemes, all of a sudden that's turned off as well. So the protection of the fundamentals of public space has become really, really clear to us. It's also changed our, our understanding, spatial understanding. So we've learned loads and loads of new words in language <laughs> in this time, but also spatial language. We've really had to understand what two meters between us looks like and tried to teach that to children and tried to negotiate what that might mean when you're jogging past people. And that will probably stay with us for a long time, I think. Um, one of the things that's really exciting though, is that now all of a sudden, things that we've been talking about for a long time as aspirations about rebalancing cars and pedestrian movement, bringing children back into streets, different uses of public space have all just uh, sped up by about 10 years. 
So those conversations are happening now in a really, really vital and fast way because they have to, which is brilliant. So the opportunity is how we, we don't forget, actually, and that we, that we really use it and we really think about what we want from these spaces because for the foreseeable future, we need to all be outside uh, the, at least the next, um, yeah, ne ne the coming months. We will be outside for everything. So how we design and rebalance them is the greatest opportunity we have now, I think. Yeah, you sort of have this uh, weird moment where you've got people getting to know their neighbours almost for the first time and exploring their neighbourhoods for the first time, like properly, because you're you're forced to be at home exploring it in new ways. Um, and at the same time, being forced to be outside. Um, and so I think it's quite exciting seeing communities sort of come together and start to reclaim certain territories as well um, and starting to reclaim the street. And then you sort of have this bottom up and, and top down um, sort of approach of starting to reclaim the city. Yeah, there's like a kind of interesting sense of localism that's erupting globally. In a, it's, so it's a kind of weird way that we're connected. But also, I think um, it's an important moment to think about like what this means for the design of, of public spaces going forward, um, like returning to kind of some of the previous comments about materiality, but also the the difference between interior and exterior spaces just because we live in a country that doesn't always have the best weather and if we're constrained to just being outside um, then how do we make sure that people can still come together in a safe way when the weather isn't so great as it is right now um, like I think a lot of people over the last weeks have commented about how that in if, if this had to happen at a specific time at least it's happening at a time where we can go outside and enjoy um, our outdoor spaces for longer periods of time but um, in the long term, we need to think about like how we do this in in a way that can actually have some longevity. If this is if we're going to have to live with coronavirus, um, and how we can go beyond just overlaying these two meter grids onto spaces, but actually think more meaningfully about what sort of sort of activities and interactions um, these spaces could contain. But it's also brought about really important conversations about like why can't any why can't anyone access a golf course when it's closed like um why are all like these playgrounds and certain parks even um closed off to the public um when those are the only spaces we can access right now and it's almost like a no-brainer to open them up and i think that's a really important conversation that's being brought to the forefront of, of things yeah it also hasn't changed most of the politicization of the use of public space so uh in recent weeks as well or as lockdown changes there's quite a lot of judgment about whether people are using spaces in the right way or not and it's it's quite overt you know so the nearest public space to me the daily mail regularly sends a photographer down to photograph people to shame them which uh, is great um but and people calling the police to report that people are having a picnic and they shouldn't be and these really specific almost amazing sets of rules about what you can and can't do that you can sit but as long as you're not sunbathing so we're navigating that and that's a really interesting i mean it's a, it's a phenomenon that we'll be looking back on for, for a very long time but that kind of judgment which i know we've spoken about before as as part of all public space and the public life is is almost ramping up in this time I think there's also a case where we need to understand how to measure immateriality because it's so subjective and to, for it to be included in, say, this conversation and within public spaces or privatised public spaces even in a more holistic way, I think our value systems don't allow for it currently. So the economic system and the political system that we're situated in don't measure immateriality or things that are ephemeral or a bit um, unknown, should I say, or unseen or hidden. So immaterial, immateriality has so much wealth and yet we don't know how to measure it in a way that feels like it can be equal to material wealth. So I think this idea of say, language is a really important one um, to make it more inclusive. So I don't know if you can uh, open up slide five, which has a quote on it um, by Lou Down. The quote here really puts it into context for me. 
So nouns are for experts and verbs are for everyone. So how I would describe this in the material world is at the moment, we have a categorization system that is only based on type. So materials are understood as wood, metal, plastic, glass, textiles even. And they get put into these rigid boxes where you don't understand what their behaviors are, their functionalities are, that you have to be an expert to really understand what this material can do. So therefore the nouns are relevant in that sense, but actually everybody works with the material. So why shouldn't everybody understand what materials are and what they can do and how they can actually be involved in their lives or how much um, care they offer is and vice versa. So it's so much about humanizing these materials, basically, for us to be able to engage with them in a more humanistic way. So reframing language for materials to be say, oh, I am flexible or I am cold or soft or um, cuddly. I don't know. There's like so many ways of like describing materials which have emotional qualities and functional qualities. And that's something that I'm doing a lot of. Um, so language makes it more inclusive basically and this way of like um, that's the very beginning phase of it and also it relates to dare I say it um, decolonizing it as well so I think um, we need to be more inclusive in that sense as well of like not trying to um, impose how something should behave when there's so many interpretations of how a material can be placed in certain spaces. We can manipulate materials for them to be, like a wood can be flexible, but it can also be a fabric. It can also be solid surfaces and so many things. The versatility of every single material is infinite, I would say. So I think there's so much around that in terms of how we can make it more equal to immaterial and material need to be coexisting basically. Yeah that touches on so many things that Maddie and I are interested in exploring in the pavilion but also in um, how we can change the way we design privatized public spaces so I think inclusivity and what that really means is so important. I think often um, the, it shouldn't just be a conversation between architects or developers and landowners but it should really engage the public and in order to do that I think people are are much better equipped to describe what they want to do in a public space or the way they feel but not necessarily like how that should manifest as a kind of form of design and so that's the kind of important role that architects can play to facilitate this conversation and bring people around the table um, but then equally i think in the exhibition um, we're keen to construct rather than just representing architecture through drawings and models that like you would find in a traditional exhibition we're keen for it to be an immersive experience that everyone can interact with and enjoy in a very similar way. And, um, and as a result, we didn't want to be too didactic about telling people like this is what you should do in each of these spaces, but really the exhibition hopefully will become a way to test what people actually do. And it will hopefully be things we never even imagined as a way to learn from it, to then construct a series of live projects across real um, public spaces. To, um, to kind of bring them to life and activate them in new ways. So um, I think that it's all these things you've raised are so important in terms of how we rethink privatized public space and maybe all public spaces. Yeah, I think language is particularly important as often like architects just sort of talk in their own language and it really alienates everyone else. Um, and something we're really trying to do is make this a conversation that everyone can engage with because it's so important to have different uh, people who are all coming together as part of this conversation. Um, I also think that um, what you just showed probably relates quite well to our third image, um, which is looking at Stuart Semple's hostile design. Um, so Stuart Semple's an artist and he sort of was really outraged um, when he noticed some people in his local area adding metal bars onto benches um, to stop homeless people from sleeping on them and uh, that's sort of called hostile design um, and so he's, he made these stickers that people can purchase from his website and um, 
to make people more aware of hostile design around them. Um, and they're these design crime stickers. Um, I think it's a really interesting way to get people more aware of what's going on around them, um, to also tell um, those in charge that this is a design crime, this is not right. Um, and it's sort of looking at how um, sort of really small interventions actually can, can start to um, create sort of more of a conversation about this um, and sort of looking at, I suppose, these more sort of temporary ways of using materials. It's also interesting in that it was a physical, like it was a, a campaign that happened in physical space through the stickers, but also online because it had a hashtag. So it was like a social media campaign. So it meant that people locally and globally could engage in the conversation. I think um, our contribution to, to the catalogue with you is um, really reflecting on the work that we've done this year with the, the, the GLA for children and young people and independent mobility and play and it really not being a given that play is an accepted use of space really in most not not only privatized public spaces but if you think about um, and quite what it reminds me of in the stickers is the no ball game sign it is unbelievably hard to get them taken down and for one of the things that we had to write into the into the policy is that play is a legitimate use of the space and you'd think that that would be quite uh, a very straightforward thing to say but it isn't so it's we have some way to to move and to think about those things and to understand that uh, we should be seeing children in public space a lot more than we do we don't see them in many of our public spaces and um, until you stop to think about that then you you, you realize that that's what's happening yeah, I really like that. Um, I think you wrote something along the lines of uh, when when children don't feel welcome or don't feel like they can play in a space, that's when you know this space isn't working. Um, yeah. It's almost like everyone should be thinking about that, about all kinds of public space, whether or not they're specific play spaces. Exactly. Yeah. I think um, on that note, um, I'll just say, personally, I think one of the things that I find most exciting about the proposition for the British Pavilion is this idea that it, we're using it to, not just as you said, a normal exhibition, but actually as a way to stimulate debate and hopefully we will unearth things that we couldn't have possibly imagined. Um, and that's, I think, um, really exciting uh, as it develops and we'll see it next year. So we have um, a very active audience, I'm pleased to, to say. We've already had a declaration of love for Manage. so I think um, we need to go into our questions. Um, we have our first question, I believe, comes from Rob. So over to you, Rob Keane. I think we're just, there's Rob. Hi, Rob. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, just, uh, I don't know, I kind of posed this question maybe um, too early and then people started talking. So I hope it's still relevant. Um, uh, I guess I'm interested in the, the, the borderlands between public, truly public space and then privatised public space. I'm just wondering what the panel think about those moments where sometimes you might get um, rigid borders that can be closed off and a lot, a lot of the general public actually welcome that sense of security. So it's, you know, although we kind of, we know that there is a problem where you make the city less accessible. And then, and then also, I guess, in those, in those borderlands, there are useful va vagaries, you know, so say outside the pub, the, the street becomes this weird place where it's part of the pub, but it's also part of public space and no one really knows who has the right of way. And that's quite an enjoyable, I think that's quite an enjoyable moment. Um, so I was just wondering, yeah, what, what you thought about, you know, the, the sort of uh, the hard borders and the spaces in between. I think it's a really interesting question because this whole thing is quite a grey area. If we, uh, if, can you just bring out the image of Golden Square that I have, um, please? So if you think about a lot of uh, really beloved, maybe central London spaces, they are actually private and Golden Square in Soho is a really good example. It's leased by the local authority from trustees. They're owned privately and they have rules. 
but they're really loved and not heavily policed, but they are closed at night. This one, in fact, I was going to bring this for an image of, for immateriality, which is when you look at this space from above, it's almost like looking at a clock. Everyone follows the sun. I mean, that will change. Uh, climate change is going to change that. But at the moment we shift, it's, it's an incredible space to be in. And it feels very free, but it's technically not. So it's, it's not always as straightforward. And those, those understanding and negotiations that we do every day, I think, are the, are the most interesting part of this aspect and what you're trying to do with the pavilion. It, yeah, it's actually this gray area that we that we're most interested in. Um, and that's why we actually chose the topic of privatized public space, because too often it becomes this binary conversation where um, private is considered bad and public is considered good. But um, it's it's a kind of flawed understanding of the huge amount of nuance and gradients of, of degrees of privacy and publicity in loads of different spaces um, across the world. And um, I think the, the negotiation between these, these two types of spaces or the two extremes is what we find so interesting. So um, the fact that, that that kind of zone outside of the pub is, isn't really owned by either the pub or um, a pub, as a public space, but it kind of sits between the two depending on the time of day. And it allows for different activities is something that we find really fascinating. And that's the kind of space that should exist more instead of these hard lines and borders. And um, we think there's too, um, too often people just problematize privatized public space rather than going a bit deeper to look at its potential. So there's a kind of nostalgia for the time when you know, the state would support a lot of public space, which doesn't really exist right now. I mean, maybe right now during this time of crisis, the state has a greater influence, but for several years, um, there have been cuts to um, spending in public space and the private sector is actually quite willing and able to get involved as long as we ensure that things like access and use um, are protected and are done on um, the terms of the people who actually use those spaces. So it's a really good question. I think that it's exactly that, this kind of much more nuanced way of understanding the negotiation between public and private that we're trying to explore in the pavilion. Could I add a little bit to that as well, actually? Um, so something I'm looking into at the moment is um, material rights. So the fact that materials can maybe have ownership of something as well. So rather than like being human centric and thinking that humans own everything, I think there's an opportunity here to open up that dialogue and that conversation around other species and them having claiming a space as well and being part of that conversation in terms of like their own rights. We have human rights, we have animal rights, but what about material rights? Do they have ownership of this space as well? So these are just questions I'm throwing out there, but it's a lot of what I'm developing in my own practice, but I think it's a relevant part of the conversation here, just to open it up beyond the human, basically. Yeah, it's interesting to think as well with the materials, like how they change over time and how that can really affect the way people are using spaces. Because I think we think the most successful spaces are the ones that people have sort of claimed in ways you never would have expected. Um, and how, um, yeah, like the, the pub, like how it just transforms depending on the people rather than very, being given a very specific uh, kind of use. Um, and it'd be really interesting to kind of leave different spaces over to different materials like that and just see how it changes over time. Because yeah, maybe the material be like, I'm actually not suitable for this environment, maybe put me in something else. And actually, that there lies the conversation. And I think between the human and the material, and I think that's a really important one to be having and making it more relatable. And therefore, once it's more relatable, it can be more inclusive. Basically. Anna, did you want to say something? No, I think I've, yeah. I've, yeah. <laughs> um, great. Um, thank you so much, Rob, for your question. Um, we have another question uh, come in from Marshall Marcus. Mar Marshall, can I ask you to ask your question, please? Hi, Marshall. Hi, I don't know if you can see me. Um, thanks. Um, a bit like Robert, actually, my question slightly changes as as a result of hearing 
the conversation that goes. I mean, I I was wanting to ask about the the the, the change in the idea of how we accept that there is a privatized space that can encroach more and more in our cities and of course manager you know you're pointing out that actually we should probably be looking at this in a more nuanced way but i was just quite interested about this question should we be giving up the idea that we should be challenging some of those things i was thinking of an example this morning i happened to be walking around the city in london and i walked through the som building that you know the new rothschild building behind st stephen walbrook and I was trying to take a picture of the back of the, the tower from there. And then somebody came out and said to me, um, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're on public property. You're on private property. Uh, again, interestingly enough, there's no signage to say that, that actually you're on private property there. And it was a very nice kind of uh, discussion because he was a very reasonable guy. But basically his role was to get me off what was looked like a public space that went through to a garden. And I'm just always interested by how you know, over the years, the, the attitude of that seems to have changed. And we do seem to have, we, if it, uh, there's a terrible generalization, but we seem to have kind of given in on that. I mean, Anna, you, you must be obviously working around City Hall. That's another really interesting area. I only discovered recently that, that what was known as the, what is it, London Bridge City Phase 2 from the Cotton Centre to London Bridge is actually private land. I hadn't known that. Um, and again, how we show these things and how we accept these things, I think, are important things. And um, yeah, so that was the kind of area I was quite interested to get your views on. I, I think we should always challenge that, actually. I think we should still always be challenging it because some of the... Uh, and I think perhaps from... A, so basically, when public was asked about 10 years ago, there was a lot more of this, you know, high vis jacket, massive control of public space. It was really problematic. And also next to City Hall, during the Olympics, I was stopped from taking a photo of the bridge with the Olympic Rings and said, no, you can't step on this. This is private. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And yeah. we've... I've had to say we've seen a move away from it because people have understood that people providing private spaces understood that you actually need people. <laughs> they actually want people in. So it moved. But those ones, those regressive ones, we, we have to always challenge it because there's no good reason why you can't photograph any of these things or why you can't be close to them. And we, I don't think we can accept it. So it is still a privilege to build in, in cities and in all of these places. And the ground plane is is shared by all of us. So we need to even though there are grey areas, but we need to make sure that we put rules in place that protect the, our, our rights. Within the city. I, I agree with you, Anna, but I just have the sense that actually over the years, that sense of ownership that we might be entitled to of a privatised public space gets more and more eroded to the extent where it becomes a blanket acceptance by most people and that kind of if you see the yellow high vis jacket it's almost that you'd you'd kind of okay well I, I accept that and i think that's reinforced by the way by that wonderful language of hostile design image that was shown the very use of the banded yellow which you know ironically is exactly the same as the government uses for its nhs kind of presentations on coronavirus it th these are ways that we are corralled I don't want to sound too naive about this. We are corralled into gradually and slowly accepting this. And, you know, that's why I welcome this idea of opening up a real dialogue about let's actually talk about what, you know, who really owns this privatised public space. Yeah, I think that's exactly why we almost started looking into this topic, because we were just so curious about how there are so many areas of the city that you didn't even know were private land. You, you know, you think yes. they're public land. Um, and it becomes really dangerous when suddenly you can't do any activities. So like manager was saying earlier um, with the Occupy London protest, you know, what happens if there's suddenly nowhere to protest anymore because everything is private land with, with rules like that. Um, and I think just making people more aware is a first step that, mm -hmm. that a lot of these places are privately owned, um, but also yes. making people aware of um, what the rules are. And, I think that's why it's really important that the government does bring in some sort of regulation um, around yeah. the, the people responsible. I, I mean, actually, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to send, end up sounding too London centric, but I was just thinking of what you're saying there. And I was remembering that huge argument in the 80s about the, the, the Mies van der Rohe building and the new square. And, you know, we'd learn in the papers now that part of that was Margaret Thatcher's worry 
that this was just going to be, you know, post IRA worry of bonds, this was just going to be another open space which could be used, um, you know, violently. And the idea that that might be the, the one of the major decision makers on, on a major uh, London kind of thing like that. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, these things happen and they kind of drip down into our into our memory and, and, and disappear, in my opinion. And that's why I think the memory of this stuff, you know, the memory of these changes is so interesting. It's so important to retain. Yeah, there's a, a really good book by Brett Christopher called The New Enclosure that really frames this problem really well. Yeah. We recommend it. It was like on our, one of our main, main readings and he also wrote a short piece for our catalog to frame the problem. Yeah. Um, but he talks about the kind of fire sale of public land that's happened over several decades and, and he traces it back to kind of where this understanding of, of who owns what comes from. So even though we think that public land belongs to all of us, often what's done with it or when it's sold isn't, uh, isn't really obvious to any of us. And I think that's something that's quite worrying as well. And it's, it makes the, re the need to have this conversation so urgent and important. I mean, I think in London, the public London charter is an important part of thinking about that. And it's good that that's coming. And also something that, we, that we've written about uh, for the catalogue is that last year, um, it be everyone became aware of a, an estate uh, that had been developed in South London where there was private play space and affordable play space. Yeah, yeah. And, affordable. and everyone was yeah, rightly sure. outraged. I mean, this was sure. absolutely sure. Hor horrific situation to be in. And it, it was so outrageous that it changed the rules in London planning immediately and national within three months. So sometimes I think we do accept things and we, we just let them slip past. And because we everyone saw that through the eyes of what it must be like a child, for a child looking from one to the other, it suddenly made us realise, actually, this isn't acceptable for any of us. So it really, really catalyzed everything. And a lot of, I know that a, a lot of, um, local authorities, they get a lot of comments now in planning about, well, who can use this space? What is it for? And I think we are more aware. So that's where we keep, that you have to keep bringing pressure in the planning system as well. So the, the example that Anna talked about, we have an image of, it's our like second slide, if that can be brought up. And um, it's a kind of screenshot from the Guardian article um, about this, where um, luxury flats aren't being sold as a result of um, kind of greater uh, square meters in the flat itself, but because of the additional areas um, of playgrounds and gyms and things like that that exist in the development, which really should be accessible to everybody, including those in affordable accommodation and instead are being tacked on as luxury. And so um, the image when you finally see it um, is, uh, is really interesting because it, or it's really heartbreaking um, because it's basically showing that two children in the same building unable to play together um, just as a product of this uh, kind of economic circumstance and these weird barriers that are built within a development to prevent one group of children from playing with the others. And as a child, you don't really understand what's preventing you from getting there. So it, this is like really uh, drives the problem home, as Anna said in terms of what we as architects need and and as everyone i guess as stakeholders around this table need to do to change this conversation to prevent things like this from happening uh thank you marshall for your question Thanks. i think you know, clearly um you know a very um important thing that we could actually talk a lot more about that but we have lots of questions to get through so i'm going to move it on to our next question thank you again marshall um and our next question is from francesca Perry. Francesca, are you there? Hi, Francesca. Hi. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm very sorry not to be in Venice with you all. Um, but thank you so much for uh, talking tonight. I was interested in the discussion about how the pandemic has highlighted the importance of inclusive access to outdoor public space. There has been talk recently about opening up private school sports fields to public use. Um, I just wondered if you thought maybe that holds promise and whether there are potentially other examples of private open space that you think could or should be opened up to inclusive use. Yeah, I, th I thought it was really interesting. So I was talking to some of my colleagues um, who are based in European cities and they said that where they live, like 
school playgrounds are already like the heart of communities that they're, they're already open and they just thought it was crazy that we were even having this conversation and why why it's not already like that um and i think it's yeah i i mean i th i think there's there does seem to be quite a bit of momentum behind opening up things like school school playing fields and also golf courses um and really hope that you know that momentum keeps going so that they they do get opened up quite uh, quickly um i thought something else that was quite interesting was i live very near victoria park which early on was sort of closed off um and you suddenly realize that this this land that you thought was publicly accessible park um was suddenly closed and very quickly the council had to respond to that and um, they did end up reopening it although it reduced opening hours um and so yeah i think um just sort of these examples of um of, of where you allow the public to go where you allow people um to socialize and, and be outside um and use uh, just being brought to the forefront of a conversation like this is is really promising and hopefully it will get expedited a bit like anna's um example earlier of of the planning regulations having to change very quickly um due to um due to the example and with the with the housing scheme hopefully something similar will happen but there's some way to go yet yeah yeah i live opposite um a, a school and i can see the playground from outside my window right now and um uh it's I don't, during the day it's still quite used because there's a lot of kids of key workers that are still going to school but um on in the evenings and weekends it's like a huge space that could be used in order to take some of the pressure off the local parks but I think Anna mentioned earlier as well, this kind of incentive to open up streets would be great. Like there's, I, I live on a dead end street and it's used a lot by the kids on my street to play in, but other kids could come to and play there. And I think there, um, there's a whole movement to create more play streets um, that's usually done by just resident associations, but actually um, working with local authorities. But actually if there was a move to try and think strategically across larger areas of the country about what spaces could be opened up for play or other activities. It would take some of the pressure off the, the parks um, that maybe aren't as, as um, frequently distributed across huge swathes of the country. It's quite interesting because of course the street was the original playground as well. Um, and then with the onset of the motor car, it became too dangerous for kids to play outside. And now with, with people using the car less and uh, like less pollution and stuff, people can start to go back and, and reclaim the streets. Yeah, it's funny. I, I live near Victoria Park as well. And we had roadworks on my street the other day. And just that, which meant cars couldn't get through meant the kids flooded the street, started playing football, you know, drawing chalk everywhere. And it's, I think, as someone said earlier, you know, if, if, a, if a kid feels welcome to use that space, that means it's a successful public space. And there is an organization called Urban 95, which works specifically on those grounds. Um, but, you know, if, if you make one change and suddenly a space starts getting used like that, it's a good indicator that people want that kind of space. One of the reasons that we stopped short in our work with GLA in, in um, putting in that the, the playgrounds would all be opened is because schools have a long, they have a quite a difficult, it's quite difficult for them, basically on insurance grounds. It's really, really <laughs> pragmatic, prosaic, but it's, at the moment they are private. So as soon as you step into that space, they're liable for you. And that's not the same in every country. So there's all these kinds of strange anomalies that may and also they're worried about it being damaged basically they don't have any money anyway so if anything gets damaged this is a disaster for us so but we can't you know that doesn't mean that we accept that forever that can't be like that which it's how we've already thought about that space in the first place that's made that the situation that the school is responsible for anything that might happen there because they are really huge spaces and we don't you know again this has shown we don't have enough space we really don't in the city anyway. And uh, it does feel like that. if if some if they open up that space, then surely um, the pub, like if it becomes more publicly accessible, then surely they shouldn't just be the only people who are liable for that space. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if materials can play a role here or that the nature of care and respect as like human, human nature um, can play a role here in terms of like how we care and respect for spaces due to the materials that are applied into these spaces. So like Manager was saying earlier, like, can we not say what you can do in these spaces? So if say a material was antibacterial naturally, 
would that feel safer? Would that feel like you would care for it more? Would that feel like you would respect it more? And I think there's, there's a lot around that that can be explored to make it feel more inclusive or accessible even. And I even think the term isolation now is kind of obviously shifted in the way that we um, engage with it. Um, and thinking about that word in terms of like what we're doing to ourselves in terms of not gathering anymore in like larger groups of people. But thinking about it in like a wider context, nothing works in isolation. So looking at that from, from, it, from that perspective, everything needs to be more harmonized and um, we need to be working together and this idea of like things working in isolation doesn't, it's not the reality basically. So there's multiple layers and multiple systems we need to go through to understand how things work. And the immaterial layer doesn't really come into that conversation as much. So therefore it needs to. Great, thank you so much, Francesca, for your question. Um, our next question comes from Pip Yuan, and it's a question about um, future scenarios in biodiversity. And I wonder um, if we get Pip up on the screen, maybe uh, Sital, you could answer this, and I'm, I'm imagining that you might be well-placed to answer it in the first instance. Over to you, Pip. Hi, I'm BB. Uh, I'm a master's student from London College of Communication. I'm going to just save our time and I'll go it very briefly. So this is a pretty different question that I would like to up a little bit up from your imagination about embrace di uh, biodiversity into the future pri privatized space. Because scientists have already indicated that human health and nature are strong linked together. How um, biodiversity loss impact on human health. So could you give me some like a future scenario or just some wild ideas about how public space can embrace the relationship between nature and human health so we can support each other more? Okay, so you're asking about human health and how that can encourage biodiversity in public space. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it does actually relate to the point I made earlier in terms of um, care and respect as well. And also the fact that language needs to be reframed and it to be made anti-capitalistic and also de decolonized. And I think therefore that initial layer of biodiversity can start to happen because we start to use materials to their full potential and not just for their, you know, generic use, um, which is what we're so used to. That every space becomes more homogenous because of that generic use. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be a lot more legislation in place for these materials to be legalized in those spaces for the, that particular use. But there also needs to be a mention of materiality and immateriality exists um, beyond the human, so not just like physical materials, but also um, other species, for example, like trees, their surroundings, and like have to be more mindful as to what other things or living things and non-living things exist in that space to encourage biodiversity. And I think this also lends itself to what Manager was saying earlier about it not being binary. So everything works in, you know, that everything's connected. Like everything is made of something like materials. Everything is also connected. So we need to understand what those connections are and for that to be more visible perhaps to us in order for, for us to understand how they are connected. So I think materials need to be more versed, use more versed, versatility, <laughs> uh, used in a more versatile way, should I say. And also the language needs to change for that to happen. And therefore there needs to be a wider sort of understanding as to what other species exist within that space as well. Yeah, I mean, one of our images, I think that if, they could, if you could bring up the image of the tree in Bedford Square, please. Um, 
is kind of thinking of going back to that idea of the negotiation between the public and the private, there's a similar negotiation that needs to happen between the kind of natural and the man-made. Um, and so that's something we're really interested in as well, in terms of how, um, like often even with these, these kinds of railings that are put around privatized public spaces to enclose them, nature finds a way through them in a much, um, in a much more kind of subtle but um, dramatic way than humans ever could. And I think part of the problem is that we, um, we often um, don't think about nature, as Heather was saying, um, as a kind of equal participant or user of these spaces and how do we change that dialogue. So um, actually uh, someone who's working with us on this project, um, but was also one of my students previously, uh, Ioana Mann, was, has been doing a lot of projects on how we can use um, like the, the use of drama to um, put people in different perspectives. So to, to understand public space through um, bacteria or through plants or through all of these other um, things that occupy our cities and spaces um, as a way for humans to actually start thinking about the diversity of users of these spaces that aren't just um, like, yes, human beings. And I think one of the potential benefits of some of the, of, of privately owned public spaces is, and I think it was mentioned earlier, the increased investment that can be made and with that can come a lot more planting and come a, a lot more ambition because it, it's, there's a budget to pay to manage it, which has slipped away in some, in some of the um, publicly owned space. But also we see a lot, a uh, really big appetite for people to use public space to make community gardens or planting areas. I used to be part of one and it was, it was part of the campus of, of um, a university in London and they weren't using this space, they locked it. So my neighbor persuaded them that we should use it for growing and it really, really increased biodiversity in the area. It was incredible. But uh, then we got kicked off because they want to develop it. So it's a kind of suspended permission to do those things, which is a real shame. But there is huge appetite uh, for, for growing and for making nearly every scheme that we work on. Everyone wants it to be greener, more biodiverse. It's, it's coming to London in a very big way and other cities. And so it's, it's almost unthinkable. It isn't one of the primary elements that you design with now. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for your question. Um, I hope you got a good answer. <laughs> and um, I'm now going to, we have um, just about 10 minutes left. Um, I think we have two questions that we'd like to get to. So next up we have Yegua Pukpu. Um, Yegua, are you there? Hi, Yegua. Hello, welcome. If you want to ask our panelists your question. Yes. Um, so sorry, I've been taking a lot of notes. Apologies if it's a bit on a bit garble. Um, but I'm really interested in this conversation and particularly with regards to immateriality. Um, there's, I think, a lot of space to be covered when it comes to the definitions of public. Um, like, who is this public for? You know, um, I think. Uh, there's, uh, you know, like a homeless person, like you had shown the example of the sticker that was placed to say this is a design crime, for example. Um, I keep thinking about access, you know, with regards to public spaces. I live in Nigeria, um, in Lagos, not, uh, not London, but I have visited. But I keep thinking about like in Nigeria, public space is definitely very, very constrained. Um, and I think in London, even just the idea of who can be allowed to stay in a public space, what is it used for? Um, is something that could be addressed with regards to like policies um how do how does the public actually know much about this space how do they take responsibility for it because i think there's a very there's an unspoken um, understanding that when people say public it means it's the responsibility of the government as opposed to the actual full body public um so are there ways we can use like materials or even just material design design decisions to actually get the public to take ownership of these spaces um, in order to be able to make them more egalitarian because then you have different um, stakeholders within a space so you know it's like who's allowed to pass through this membrane how do we change the permeability of the membrane i saw one of the comments talking about um you know schools being made to open their parks so who gets to have that you know that that decision making how do we engage the public in a democratic process to sort of say yeah, yes this space should be allowed for this use sorry if that's too long 
I'm on mute. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think one of the, so um, most of the rooms in the pavilion are looking at, um, at a kind of existing spaces and where we can intervene, but we have two rooms that are looking at um, proposals for government ministries that can actually change the way we make decisions about our spaces. And that's something we're really interested in exploring in terms of how can um, people or citizens have more of a say in terms of um, what happens to their spaces. So um, one of the rooms that we're developing with Public Works is looking at the idea of a citizens assembly and how a kind of more direct form of democracy can um, start to question um, the way the public can be. First, I mean, I think Maddie earlier was talking about how people can be more aware of what's happening in their public spaces, but also how can they feel like they have power and agency to, um, to decide what a space should be used for and how can this be something that could be set up and, and, and used across, uh, across the country and maybe even beyond in other countries. Yeah, and I think it's really important to make sure that every every voice is heard, because I think it's also very easy to get just like just the majority sort of making that decision, uh, and then you get a lot of you know people who are traditionally unheard, not part of that decision in process. Yeah, it's um, one of our slides. I think it's slide two. It looks at the South Bank. Um, in London, uh, which is the skateboarding, oh, it's kind of, it's, it's this Undercroft area um, of the, which was taken over by uh, skateboarders in the, in the 70s. So it was built in the 60s and then skateboarding took off in the 70s and then sort of historically became this space that was re, like reclaimed and reused by skateboarders through their actions. Uh, and it was really interesting because about 10 years ago it started to be developed um, and they were looking at closing off this area and putting shops inside um, but there was loads of um, well sort of a group was set up um, uh, to sort of save the space and um, eventually they did manage to save it and um, they, they extended it and sort of used similar types of materials that were, were originally there um, to sort of save the space and I think it sort of shows how people um, can come together through their really physical actions um, to redefine what public what what space can be um, and what it's used for. I think it's a, a really good and interesting time as well now to things that have changed and have changed very quickly or will and the things that we need to change we, we just can't accidentally go backwards really quickly and we can't forget a lot of the really bad things that we've learned in this time. So, because it will be really easy in big cities to forget and oh, phew, we're all allowed out again. But we've learned a lot about ourselves and a lot about what we thought, a lot of what we thought was equal is clearly not in any way equal. It's been really mm -hmm. eye-opening and terrifying from, from, from all, not just from the virus itself, but understanding we're not all in it together. It's not been like that. Yeah. And we need to be, we need to be really honest about that now when we think about this and not forget things but also take the opportunity to, to look at some things in much more ambitiously than we could have before and the and the new normal could be something much much better than where we were but um yeah. not forgetting is a big is the big challenge um thank you Yegua, for your question i think we have 10 minutes left i'm going to try to get one more in um thank you again so our last question comes from h elliot are you there? Um, I'm not sure if we've got H. Elliot coming there. He is or she. Hi there. Um, sorry if I missed the the, I missed the beginning of the talk, but my question kind of slightly follows on from the, um, the previous question that came through, which is there's many groups like the homeless who not only use, but literally live in these public private spaces. Do your proposals and your exhibition cater for these people who actually sleep and eat in these spaces for necessity? And are they part of the conversations and the research that you do? Um, so we've, 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 that's a really important point and um, it's something that's come up a lot in the discussions we had very early on um, when I think even applying for the competition. Um, it, I think we have tried to, to, to think about 
um, how, like, I guess, different groups of people use these spaces at very different times of day and in very different ways. I think Maddie showed um, the example of the hostile design campaign that specifically targets homeless people from sleeping in public spaces. Um, but then on the other hand, we didn't want to, I think there's a real danger of speaking too much on behalf of a group without really involving them um, in the conversation. And um, we didn't want to be tokenistic in any way to, to just have like a, a little bit of this pavilion that is devoted to that. So it's a kind of much bigger project and we would like to work with different charities and organizations um, that, that kind of help homeless people and, and understand better what how they use public spaces rather than kind of claiming to understand what it's like to be forced to live um, in these definitely not fit for purpose spaces. Okay, thank you. Just add to that actually, and even to the earlier question from Yagua, I think um, there's an opportunity here to think about um, participation here and how making something collectively can create a sense of ownership or at least agency or have some autonomy. So the idea of craft becoming part of this conversation and that being a collective sort of um, process or action or um, gathering even, I think there's so much within the making of a space and a place in terms of its materiality can create a sense of um, community, I think. And therefore, could that sort of engagement or participation create a sense of um, a shared ownership, basically. So I think it sort of applies to Harris's uh, point as well um, of like homelessness. How do they become part of that conversation as well? So could they be involved in so making those decisions and how can they sort of survive? Because a lot of this is about survival, I think. I mean, it's, and it's also, it's a very interesting and delicate ethical issue because on the one hand, there's the, you, know, you, you get the horrifying example of a few years ago where there were spikes being put outside buildings so people couldn't sleep there. And again, it's that thing that I was saying earlier on, sometimes when things are made in public space, you suddenly, the full horror of what's happening becomes clear. And in the other, it's, it would be wrong to design a space for, for a terrible situation. There is no reason in very wealthy cities, including London, that people should, that there's an expectation that people won't have somewhere to live. Once we accept that, that's absolutely the end game. I mean, it's one of the better things that's <laughs> appeared in the past few weeks is that we've somehow found the wherewithal to take care of people properly for the first time. And it's not safe to be on the streets. And it's not ideal. So it's, it's always that, that kind of balance of making sure everyone's included, but making sure that we also don't accidentally design in really bad situations in the first place. Yeah, I think that's exactly um, what we've been trying to sort of grapple with almost with these prioritised public spaces, that they should be spaces that are welcome to everyone. They allow different people to mix no matter what their background. Um, but we don't think they're a solution uh, for a housing, like for, for people to sleep in them. Um, like, it's not that we, we don't believe in the hostile design at all, but we think it's a bigger problem that we need to address, uh, which is our housing shortage. Um, and as Anna says, like it is quite amazing how um, within a few weeks, uh, the government sort of acted and managed to find uh, places for a lot of people to live and why that hasn't happened previously. Um, and hopefully that's something that will also remain after this crisis is over. Um, but yeah, within the pavilion, we're really exploring how anyone can access these spaces. Um, thank you, H. Elliot, for that question. I know you've, you've gone from the screen now, but um, we just have a couple of minutes left. I think in that remaining time, I've just obviously scribbled down my notes here. We've talked about visual language. We've talked about codes of conduct, um, opening up dialogue, issues of care and respect, ownership. Uh, play, the borderlands, material rights, biodiversity, participation. Uh, we got a lot in uh, tonight. Um, so could I ask our panelists just, just quickly for a final, a final comment um, before we close? Can I start with you, Madeline? Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, the discussion's been amazing. It's been so varied um, and sort of touched on so much. Um, but yeah, I suppose 
um, going forward. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing how privatised public space sort of evolves um, over the, the next few months as we start to sort of adapt to living with, with COVID-19. And we think it's a really important uh, time for everyone to be engaged in this topic um, as we all sort of have an opportunity to um, make sure it goes on the path to being uh, better accessible to a wider audience of people. Manager, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think uh, just following on from that last question about, um, or the last two questions about, you know, who is this public that we're designing these spaces for? I think um, so much of this discussion has focused around like kind of who has access to um, privatized public space and how that can take into account humans and non-humans, um, how it can accommodate for degrees of privacy and publicity. And so I think for us, um, we've been really questioning like what's the role of architects in this conversation and how we can stop this one size fits all designing for a generic public and instead try and think of like the many different types of people that use the space, um, a local community and their specific needs, um, ways to bring different people around the table to have a conversation around what that space should be and then ways to design those spaces so that they allow different people to use it for different activities potentially at varying times of day. So it's a hugely co complex problem and we um, I hope that like having an extra year to work on it means we can test some of these ideas out and um, show an even richer kind of experience in Venice in 2021. Thank you. Anna? Uh, echoing actually and following on, I think we, we've all been living very locally now and so there's no one size fits all. It's all about, uh, you know, and there is no one particular public you have to look very, very closely, very carefully at whatever you're building with everyone who's living there and will be living there. And each space should and, and will, it should feel really different. We shouldn't have the same spaces in even different neighborhoods in London, certainly not across the whole country. So that is the, what I'm excited about coming next is that we get that differentiation. You feel that you get much more spaces out of that place. And hopefully that era before of the kind of classic privatized public spaces on its way out and like I said before the main plea is that we learn a lot from what we've been through and how we can make things better now. Super. Mine is quite simple I think. I think it's just trying to understand what you're made of, what a place is made of, what everything is made of and that can be the material, the immaterial or the virtual. So just try to be open to complexity. I think we shouldn't shy away from it anymore. Um, thank you so much, Sita. Actually, that, that goes very well into my final question in the, in the like, minute that we have remaining. I think what I've, um, has struck me over the course of, of this conversation, but in general, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in now is that what, what matters most is, is, of course, connection and connection to our internal selves and, and to our family, friends, community, and the, and the places and spaces. So uh, we've talked about lots of lofty things tonight. I'm going to ask you a final question, which is, um, what is your favorite edible material, also known as what is your favorite food? Let's go. Uh, Anna? Uh, chilies. Chilies. Good choice. Madeline? Um, well, I had quite a lot of fun making some furniture recently out of mycelium. Um, I don't particularly like eating it though, but... <laughs> 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 but it's a, it's a fun one to try and experiment using in different ways. My favorite thing to eat would be chocolate. <laughs> Amazing. Sita? I would say okra, which are lady fingers, uh, green vegetables. My favorite. Wow. And Manadu? Um, I am jealous of Sita's choice because that's also a, a really, really good one. Um, but I'll say lentils because they're very versatile. Um, they're quite affordable and you can do loads of different things with them. <laughs> and Sevra? Um, my favorite food is olives. Yeah. Um, on that bombshell, um, I think I'm going to draw it to a close. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you to our audience for your amazing questions um, and to our panelists and um, hope to see you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.